My Adventures with Superman was back again this week on Adult Swim for another brand new episode entitled Most Eligible Superman. Now, I'm Cape Jewel, and this is the video series where I give my thoughts and feelings on the episode that was, while also shouting out any comic book easter eggs or references I can find. So, with that out of the way, let's get into it, shall we? So then, picking up directly from where last week's emotionally charged episode left off, things are very, very awkward for the news team trio. Lois's dad ran off on her again. Clark misheard a conversation between Lois and her father, which, in his sadness, caused him to activate the Kryptonian beacon alone. And if that wasn't bad enough, after everything went south at Star Labs, Jimmy wasn't able to stand up for Superman in the moment. Needless to say, everyone feels real bad, but before Lois and Clark get a chance to actually talk things out, Perry is already sending them on their next big assignment. It seems that Superman has been chosen as one of Metropolis's most eligible bachelors, and will be honored with a special ceremony later that day. Normally, Clark wouldn't go in for this kind of thing, but it turns Turns out the show is actually a big supporter of local children's charity, so it's not like he can say no or anything. The only person not happy about this arrangement is Cat Grant, the planet's gossip and entertainment columnist. After all, this is normally her beat, but Perry wants the Superman team writing this one up. Though, Cat is quick to just invite herself on the assignment anyway, and I gotta say, I like the kind of energy she brings to the show. She's funny, but in a very different way than, say, Lombard is funny. She's also not a total dummy like him either. Either. In fact, Lois spends much of the episode afraid that Cat might actually crack the code that her and Superman are dating. The best part being that while Cat is certainly smart enough to have figured out that Superman probably has a secret identity that is worth protecting, she is not smart enough to see that Clark is very clearly Superman and has been the whole time. This also means in order to protect his and Lois's relationship as well as his secret identity, Clark as Superman is going to have to pretend to be single for the rest of the show taping, which I'm sure will will not lead to any jealousy or any more misunderstandings at all, right? Now, at the other end of the episode, we have Jimmy, who, while trying to avoid dealing with Clark, actually saves a woman from getting hit by a truck. This Hollywood meet-cute moment ends up being our first official introduction to Clark's cousin, Kara zor aka the Supergirl, and oh man, is she nothing like you might expect. And honestly, I'm happy about what the show seeks to do here. One of the best things about Supergirl in the comics is that the writers basically were never ever as precious with her as they were with Clark, pretty much from day one, meaning that Kara was actually able to be free to explore, make mistakes, and do the sort of stuff that Superman the Icon probably never could, like becoming, oh, I don't know, a fire angel or a red lantern that one time. Now, in My Adventures with Superman, Kara is voiced by Kiana Madria. I hope I'm saying that right. I thought I recognized her voice somewhere, and it's because I'm a big fan of those Fear Street movies. Super underrated if you haven't seen them. She played Dina in those. Also, if Kara's outfit looks familiar to you, it's because it totally should, because that is just straight up Android 18 from Dragon Ball Z. How freaking cool is it that we get so many awesome Dragon Ball Z references here in My Adventures with Superman? Jimmy and Kara spend the rest of the day going on what is basically a date as Jimmy attempts to avoid his problems, and so we as the audience can learn a little bit more about this new version of Supergirl. For one, she's pretty damn hard-edged, claiming she's looking for her cousin, who is a great warrior, and that she has a strict father, but wait, shouldn't her father be dead? Aren't her and Clark the last of the Kryptonians? Hmm. This also isn't the first time Jimmy has been romantically linked to a Supergirl either, and I'm not just talking about the live-action CW shows. In fact, Jimmy's entire love life in the comics has entire Wikipedia pages devoted to it. And it really should, because his exes include an alien bug woman, a super thief, an Irish banshee, and even extra-dimensional beings, just to name a few. And hey, speaking Speaking of romance, back at the Bachelor show, turns out the other contestants are a who's who of impressive DC comic book deep cuts. There's the returning Hank Henshaw, who, after the fight at Star Labs last week, has only become more and more Lex-pilled. Even choosing to lash out at Superman using Luther's very own xenophobic anti-alien rhetoric. There's also Chandi Gupta, aka Maya, the fire archer from 90s Justice League Europe, and I don't think much else when I stop and think about it. That's an impressive reference, but the next contestant, Bryna Brilliant, really blew my socks off because they just so happen to be the non-binary 
Wonder Woman villain known as the Blue Snowman. Holy crap, a nerdy deep cut and some non-binary representation all at once, hats off to the writers. And of course, who could forget Silver St. Cloud, who's best known for being Batman's major love interest back in the 70s, as well as one of the only people who was able to clock that Bruce and Batman have very similar jawlines, don't you think? Here in the show, St. Cloud is reimagined as a major influencer and philanthropist, as well as a woman with some big, strong arms. Again, I love these small changes that help add extra personality to the supporting cast in this show, as well as offer a world filled with lots of different, varied body types. Hell, even the first person to ask Superman a question is actually George Taylor from the Metropolis Star. He was actually Superman's first boss all the way back in Action Comics number one. Only to be replaced by Perry later on, I have to wonder if we're going to see this character come back in some way, and if he has a pre-existing relationship with Perry. Now things start spiraling out of control when it seems like Superman and Silver actually hit it off on the show. Isn't it funny that Lois was the one who told Superman to act, yet she's the one who ends up getting her feelings hurt first, no doubt still dealing with abandonment issues related to her own father, and this season's bigger theme of loneliness that we discussed last week. Cat sure doesn't help things out either by saying that it only makes sense that someone as extraordinary as Superman would need an equally as extraordinary partner by his side, not someone normal and plain like Lois. What I find really interesting about this bit of character development here in the show is that I don't think we've ever seen comic Lois get hurt in a way such as this, mainly because comic Lois is so secure in herself, but this younger show version, you know, still has a lot of growing to do herself. And wouldn't you just know it, it's only when Clark and Lois start fighting do they both end up letting their personal secrets slip, and at the worst possible time, too, as it's only right here right now that Kara has found her way to everyone else, and she is not happy with what she sees. Her long-lost cousin, the last son of Krypton, acting like a clown for the entertainment of weak, pitiful humans well below his station as a great Kryptonian conqueror. Yep, that's right, everyone. Supergirl is evil. In fact, she's the one that we saw in that Kryptonian battle armor at the end of last season, and as far as twists go, I gotta say this is pretty damn strong. The General Zod red herring from last season and totally had me fooled big time. And you know what, it's not like Supergirl from the comics hasn't had some flirtation with villainy in the past, be it as a thrall to Darkseid or when she got blasted with Dark Kryptonite. In fact, we can kind of see influences on her suit that the show takes from those stories I mentioned. Also, how fun is it in season one, Superman had his own magical girl Sailor Moon style transformation and here we see Kara have her own Sentai inspired transformation when she puts the Kryptonian battle on armor on. Superman and his cousin end up having themselves a knockdown drag out battle where we can see that while she is much more vicious than her cousin and while she's able to make use of some amazing Kryptonian technology to give her an edge, she does not have all the same varied powers that Superman has. In fact, using his ice breath when he did might very well have been the only thing that saved Superman as Primus, the one who was actually pulling Kara's strings, the one she refers to as father and the one we know as Brainiac because while well, he's voiced by Ben Linus from Lost. Actually tells her that plans have changed and instead of killing Kal-El, he wants him captured and brought back for further study. And it's on that shocking note right there, the episode comes to a close. And so that was Most Eligible Superman. And once again, My Adventures with Superman offers up a fearless remixing and remastering of some very classic comic book storylines. While also keeping the focus clearly on character and characterization. If season one was seeing Lois and Clark finally come together and fall in love, this is all about their relationship surviving its first set of bumps. It's just, you know, their big Superman-sized bumps. Furthermore, introducing Kara as a villain also ends up granting some credence to Luthor's anti-alien rhetoric from before. Oh sure, Clark and Superman aren't dangerous aliens hell-bent on conquering Earth, but unfortunately those aliens do indeed exist, and Earth is probably going to need Superman if they ever hope to stop them. Overall, I'd call this one another winner of an episode, and I can't wait for next week to see what happens next.